This Bible study is not a subject for debate, but to enlighten a Christian human and to spark his or her curiosity to truly search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. John 5.39 Hi again. It's me, Celeste. We had such a good time last time, so I'm so excited about tonight's study. I can't wait to get started. Tonight's Bible study will be... The Five Old Ministry Our opening scripture will be coming from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We'll read part of verse 11 and part of verse 12. It reads, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We'll look at each gift or each ministry separately. Let us begin our study with the Apostle. When delegates of Christian communities were charged with conveying those church contributions to a charitable fund, they were described by Paul as messengers or apostles of the church. Jesus also used the word this way when he quoted the proverb, A servant is not greater than his master, nor he who is sent, literally an apostle, greater than he who sent him. Jesus himself is called the apostle of our confession, a reference to his function as God's special messenger to the world. The word apostle has a wider meaning in the letters of the apostle Paul. It includes people who, like himself, were not included in the twelve, but who saw the risen Christ and were specially commissioned by him. Paul's claim to be an apostle was questioned by others. Apparently, Paul also counted James, the Lord's brother, as an apostle. This James was not one of the twelve. In fact, he was not a believer in Jesus before the crucifixion. It was the resurrected Lord who appeared to James and presumably commissioned him for his ministry. When Paul says Jesus was seen not only by James but also by all the apostles, he seems to be describing a wider group than the twelve to whom Jesus appeared earlier. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 28 and Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, apostles were listed along with prophets and other saints as part of the foundation of the household of God. In this strictly New Testament sense, apostles are confined to the first generation of Christians. At an early stage in the church's history, it was agreed that apostles to the Jews and Gentiles should be divided into separate camps. Paul and Barnabas were to concentrate on the evangelization of Gentiles. Peter, John, and James, the Lord's brother, were to continue evangelizing Jews. As pioneers in the work of making converts and planting churches, apostles were exposed to special dangers. When persecution erupted, they were the primary targets for attack. Paul, in particular, welcomed the suffering he endured as an apostle because it was his way of participating in the suffering of Christ. The authority committed to the apostles by Christ was unique it could not be transmitted to others. The apostles could install elders or other leaders and teachers in the church and they could authorize them to assume special responsibilities but apostolic authority could not be transferred. Their authority has not come to us through their successors it has come through their writings which are contained in the New Testament. Our next subject is the prophet. The prophet, a person who spoke for God and who communicated God's message courageously to God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. The prophet's call. Prophets receive their call or appointment directly from God. 
Some prophets, like Jeremiah or John the Baptist, were called before birth. But their privilege was not a birthright. Their authority came from God alone, whose message they bore. Who can match the eloquence and brilliance of Isaiah, the depth of emotion and melancholy of Jeremiah, or the dramatic and dogged spirit of Ezekiel? A prophetic call was a call to liberty and freedom to be oneself. Human bias and criticism. The call of the prophets required that they not be intimidated or threatened by their audience. Prophets sometimes became quite dramatic and acted out their messages. Isaiah went naked and barefoot for three years. Ezekiel lay on his left side for 390 days and on his right side for 40 more. Zechariah broke two staffs. Making themselves a spectacle, prophets not only aroused curiosity but also invited the scorn of their peers. Except for God's call, prophets had no special qualifications. They appeared from all walks of life. They included sheep breeders and farmers like Amos and Elijah, but also princes like Abraham and priests like Ezekiel. Even women and children became prophets. In rare circumstances, God used the hesitant or unruly to bear his message. Balaam prophesies the Lord's message but was actually an enemy of God. Saul certainly was not in fellowship with God when he prophesied. Some prophets were called for a lifetime, but sometimes prophets spoke briefly and no more. In either case, a prophet spoke with the authority of the Holy Spirit. One trait characterized them all, a faithful proclamation of God's word and not their own. Jesus' reference to himself as a prophet in St. John chapter 12 verses 49 through 50 rests upon his standard of faithfully repeating God's word to people. Many scholars deny that prophecy includes the prediction of future events, but fulfillment was, in fact, the test of a prophet's genuineness. Whether prophets' words were fulfilled within their lifetimes or centuries later, they were fulfilled to the letter. But regardless of the time of fulfillment, the prophet's message applied to their generation as well as to ours. The main role of the prophet was to bear God's word for the purpose of teaching, reproving, correcting, and training in righteousness. Whether warning of impending danger or disclosing God's will to the people, they were similar in function to the modern preacher in the church. Prophets were referred to as messengers of the Lord, servants of God, shepherds, and watchmen important prophets of the Bible. God used people in every age to fill the prophetic role of proclaiming his word. Noah was a preacher of righteousness to his generation. Abraham was considered a prophet. So was his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. Moses was the greatest prophet of all due to his major accomplishments as well as his many writings. His successor, Joshua, received the commission to continue Moses' work and so assumed the prophetic role also. Following the entrance of the Hebrew people into the land of Cana, many prophets appeared throughout Israel's history to aid and protect the nation. The prophets mentioned in the Bible probably represent only a small portion of the total number of prophets. Most of the prophets remain obscure because they never wrote down their message. This indicates their task required face-to-face -face confrontations and a spoken rather than a written message. Many times the prophet stood alone and spoke to an unsympathetic or even hostile audience. Great courage and independence of spirit was required. 
prophets were not people of routine tasks like priests. They charted new paths for the people. It is appropriate that the first prophet mentioned after Joshua is unnamed. Prophets were to exalt God's word and not seek their own glory. This unnamed prophet appeared in the time of Gideon when Israel was falling back into idolatry. Rather than speak of the future, he called Israel to remember the Lord who delivered them from Egypt. The next prophet was Samuel, whose vocation was apparent to all from his youth. Samuel's life was spent serving diligently as a judge, leading the army to victory and establishing the religious and civil life of the nation. He both appointed and recalled the first king of Israel. Samuel provided a model for other prophets to follow. Four prophets appeared in the time of David, who himself demonstrated the traits of a prophet. They were Gad and Nathan, Zadok and Heman. Four prophets also appeared during the time of Jeroboam, Ahijah, a man of God, an old prophet, and Iddo, the seer. Iddo apparently had visions, but he confined his revelation to writing. A man of God confronted Jeroboam for his intrusion into the priestly office at the altar and prophesied the coming of Josiah by name. But his rival, the old prophet in Bethel, deceived him and brought about his death. Even though the old prophet lied, God revealed the death sentence of the man of God to him. The prophet Shemaiah appeared to Solomon's successor, Rehoboam, to stop him from attempting to reunite the country by force. The prophet Iddo recorded the acts of Abijah, the successor of Rehoboam, who himself raised a prophetic voice, although he was a wicked king. The king correctly anticipated victory over Jeroboam's troops. The next king, Asa, was promised God's blessing by the prophet Azariah when the king was returning from his victory over Zerah, the Ethiopian. But Asa did not remain faithful, seeking help instead from the Syrians when Basha threatened him. The prophet Hanani was imprisoned for rebuking Asa for not relying upon the Lord alone as in the earlier victory. Jehoshaphat was promised victory over the alliance of Moab, Ammon, and Edom by the prophet Jehaziah. The prophet Eleazar proclaimed that the alliance caused God to destroy the fleet. Then the ships were wrecked so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Five prophets appeared during the reign of King Ahab. These included the famous prophets Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was the most unforgettable and dynamic of the Hebrew prophets. He dominated the scene under Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 17 through chapter 19 and chapter 21. But his ministry continued until the reign of Ahaziah and Jehoram. His impact and eminence was compared with Moses as their joint appearance with Christ in his transfiguration suggests in St. Matthew's chapter 17 verses 1 to 13 Elijah's spectacular success over the prophets of Baal in the bringing down of rain defies comparison. His persona stands in stark contrast to Elisha who realized that his quieter personality needed some help if he were to follow a prophet like Elijah. So he asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Although he was called Elijah in the reign of Ahab, Elisha really only succeeded him in the reign of Jehoram. Doubly blessed, Elisha performed 14 miracles to Elijah's seven. Three prophets confronted kings in person. A man of God told Amaziah of Judah to dismiss his Israelite mercenaries, while another prophet rebuked 
Amaziah for saving the idols after defeating Edom. Finally, Oded secured the release of Judites captured by Israelites during the time of Ahaz. These prophets in Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings provided those books with the name of former prophets in the Hebrew canon. They actually overlapped in time with the latter or writing prophets, known commonly as the major and minor prophets. The former prophets dealt more with daily problems and the current state of affairs, while the latter prophets wrote down for latter generations what would happen in the future. The writing prophets do not appear to be in chronological order, but they provide clues that can be matched with the historical facts that suggest their proper sequence. Obadiah spoke against Edom. His ministry may have occurred in the time of Jehoram between 853 and 41 BC when Edom revolted against Judah. Joel can be dated to the time when Judah's enemies were Tyre and Sodom along with Philistia, Egypt and Edom. Since no king is mentioned, the book has been dated to the time of Joash's childhood, when Jehoiada, the high priest, was his guardian. The dates of Joash's reign are between 835 and 796 BC. The dates of Obadiah and Joel's prophecies, however, are by no means certain. In the following century, five prophets can be dated to the reigns of various kings. Hosea, probably prophesied from about 760 BC to past 715 BC, or from the time of Uzziah or Jeroboam II to Hezekiah. Amos prophesied when Uzziah and Jeroboam II ruled. Their reigns overlap for about 15 years between 767 and 753 BC and even longer if Uzziah's co-regency with his father Amaziah is counted. Jonah was a contemporary of Jeroboam II between 793 and 753 BC but his trip to Nineveh may have been before or after Jeroboam's reign. Since Assyrian power and spirit fell during the weak reign of Assyrian II between 773 and 755 BC, especially after the plague of 765 BC and the total eclipse of the sun in 763 BC, Jonah may have undertaken his successful mission shortly afterwards around 760 BC. Isaiah 1 and 1 says that Isaiah's ministry spanned four kings from the death of Isaiah in Isaiah 6 chapter first verse through Hezekiah about whom Isaiah wrote a history that Isaiah ministered after Hezekiah's death in 686 BC is evident from his recording of Shennacherib's death in 681 BC. Micah began his ministry under Jotham and finished it sometime in the reign of Hezekiah. This would suggest his ministry began after Uzziah's death in 739 BC. Since Micah does not mention Sennacherib's invasion of 701 BC, he must have concluded his ministry before that date. Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah appeared in the next century. Nahum probably wrote his prophecy in the latter half of the seventh century. Since Nahum chapter 3 verse 8 to 10 refers to the destruction of Thebes in 663 BC. Nahum probably prophesied the 612 BC destruction of Nineveh before the ministry of Zephaniah who also predicted the fall of Nineveh and dates himself to the time of Joash between 640 and 609 BC according to Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 1. 
Zephaniah's attack on idolatry suggests he wrote his work before the reforms of Josiah in 621 BC. Habakkuk's prophecy should be dated after 612 BC since he made no reference to Assyria. The prophet was concerned about the coming invasion of Babylon, probably the first one of 605 BC, in the reign of Jehoiakim, between 609 and 598 BC. Thus his work can be dated about 609 to 606 BC. Jeremiah began his work in 627 BC and continued ministering in Egypt after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Daniel and Ezekiel ministered during the captivity in Babylon. Daniel was taken to Babylon in 605 BC at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion of Judah. Ezekiel was taken there in 597 BC at the time of the second invasion. Daniel ministered until the third year of Cyrus of 536 BC. Ezekiel was called to begin his ministry in 592 BC and continued until at least 571 BC. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi ministered after the captivity when the people returned to Judah. Haggai dates his prophecy to 520 BC. Zechariah began his prophecy two months after Haggai with his first message. His other revelations came later in the year or two years later. Malachi was probably written after 432 BC when Nehemiah wrote his book because Nehemiah 13 faces the same problems mentioned by Malachi. Priestly carelessness, intermarriage with foreigners, and lack of tithing. Our next title is The Evangelist. The Evangelist, a person authorized to proclaim the gospel of Christ. In a more and narrow sense, the word refers to one of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. However, the word means one who proclaims good tidings. The Evangelist was a gift of God to the early church. These persons were not attached to any specific local church. They traveled over a wide geographical area, preaching to those whom the Holy Spirit led them. The early disciples were also called evangelists because they proclaimed the gospel. All Christians today may continue the witness of the early evangelists as they spoke and wrote of Jesus so may Christians bring this message to others. The pastor or overseer. The pastor is the feeder, the protector and guide or shepherd of a flock of God's people in the New Testament times. In speaking of spiritual gift, the Apostle Paul wrote that Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. The term pastor by this time in church history had not yet become an official title. The term implied to the nourishing of and caring for God's people. The Greek word translated pastors in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 is used elsewhere in the New Testament of sheep herders literally or symbolically of Jesus the Good Shepherd and of shepherds or leaders of the church. The New King James Version used the word pastor only in this verse. Also compare Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 1 through 2 in the King James Version. The Teacher Teaching the act of instructing students or imparting knowledge and information as used in the New Testament. The concept of teaching usually means instruction in the faith. Thus teaching is to be distinguished from preaching or the proclamation of the gospel to the non-Christian world. Teaching in the Christian faith was validated by Jesus 
who was called teacher more than anything else. Since sound instruction in the faith is essential to the spiritual growth of Christians and to the development of the church, the Bible contains numerous passages that deal with teaching. Special attention is directed to the danger of false teachings. Christians are warned to test those who pervert the true gospel. Sound teaching was a concept deeply engraved in the Jewish mind since Old Testament times. Moses and Aaron were considered teachers of God's commandments. Parents were also directed to teach their children about God and his statutes. Other parts of the fivefold ministry. Let us turn to Romans chapter 12. We'll read verses 6 through 8. Verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teach it on teaching. Verse 8. Or he that exhort it on exaltation. He that give it, let him do it with simplicity. He that rule it with diligence. He that showed mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, let us look at miracles. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament use the word sign to denote a miracle that points to a deeper revelation. Wonder. Joel chapter 2 verse 30. St. Mark chapter 13 verse 22 emphasizes the effect of the miracle causing awe and even terror. A work points to the presence of God in history acting for mankind. The New Testament uses the word power to emphasize God's acting in strength. These terms often overlap in meaning. They are more specific than the more general term miracle. These gifts or listings are not in chronological order so please don't look at them as any sort of rank. Our next word is minister or ministry. A distinctive biblical idea that means to serve or service. In the Old Testament the word servant was used primarily for court servants. Our next gift is exhortation, a message of warning or encouragement designed to motivate persons to action. The Apostle Paul often exhorted his fellow Christians to live out their callings as ministers of the Lord Jesus. Our next word is ruler or ruler of the synagogue, the leader or president of a synagogue as an administrator he was charged with supervision of all matters pertaining to the synagogue. He was not a dictator over the congregation. He was elected by the board of elders to oversee the worship service and the upkeep of the building. He chose the men to read the scriptures, to offer prayers, and to preach or explain the scripture for each meeting. If discipline was called for, the ruler of the synagogue could reprimand or excommunicate a member. Rulers of the synagogue mentioned by name in the New Testament are Jairus and Crispus and Sostenus. And finally, because God is merciful, he expects his children to be merciful. And while being merciful, let us continue to give because this is all part of the five-fold ministry. We hope you enjoyed tonight's Bible study and that it answered some of those questions that were lingering in your mind. This is Celeste saying, until next time, good night and God bless.
This has been an Ethics Ministries presentation.